Hello. Um, I'm happy today uh, in our Joseph Miller uh, Lecture Series interview with uh, Professor Alexander Gertz. Uh, he's an um, associate professor at School of Archaeology at University of Oxford and associate professor also in the Faculty of Archaeology in Leiden University. Um, he holds his master's and PhD from Leiden University from, uh, as well, and uh, he is also a senior research fellow at Boston College in Oxford. Um, previously, he held a position as associate professor in the University of Colorado, Boulder, and served as academic director of the Netherlands Research School of Archaeology. Um, I, I will keep going on with many, many more titles. Uh, a fellow of the Society of Antiqu Antiquities of London and the Royal Anthropological Institute. Uh, he has carried out archaeological fieldwork in the Netherlands, the Antilles, Mexico, Nicaragua, and also research museum collections and archives throughout Latin America. Uh, he's founding editor of the book series, The Early Americas, History and Culture at the Bill Publishers. He co-edited the Rothbridge Handbook of Archaeology and Globalization and is working now on a monograph on prehistoric storm culture from central Nicaragua, which we all are very much waiting. <laughs> and um, I think uh, what's important more to mention, uh, his work is regularly featured in different media as he worked a lot with public outreach, uh, also by his role as a National Geographic Explorer. And from my own perspective, I just want to say um, Professor Gertz is uh, my supervisor and I have had the honor to work with him for many years and I have learned a lot about Central America. So uh, I hope uh, today we will learn all more about it. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Dita, for those kind words. And um, yeah, that monograph on sculptures, gosh. Um, <laughs> what a painful, <laughs> what a painful memory you invoke. I really should get back to that at some point. And I will, you know, sometimes academia is slow. Um, thank you, welcome all, and thank you, Jan, as well, for, uh, for you know, steering all of this in the right direction. And thank you for uh, bearing the heat today. I'm assuming you're all hiding somewhere in a fridge or underneath a multitude of fans or otherwise shielded spaces. Uh, thank you for, for you know, still finding the time and the energy to attend this, uh, this lecture today. Um, so uh, I, was, I was very pleased and honored to be invited um, to this lecture series, uh, in part because of all the good things that Dita has been, has been telling me about it over the years, obviously, uh, but also specifically because of this notion of asymmetrical uh, dependency and how I might mobilize that um, in the context of the you know, pre-colonial archaeology of parts of Central America, where I, as Dita has mentioned, where I've, I've spent a good deal of my, my career of the last uh, 15 years or so. Um, and having said that, I will probably steer the debate in a slightly different direction in terms of how I understand human uh, dependencies to, uh, to develop and what might be the most consequential dependencies that we recognize them archaeologically, right? So I'll, I'll try to, uh, in this lecture, discuss uh, the intricacies of recognizing authority, politics, and power through archaeology in a broader sense in the Americas, um, see what kind of lessons we can draw from that for Central America, and then uh, what the materials that we're recovering, part of which you're seeing on this slide here at the moment, uh, what they might tell us about uh, dependency and how people relate to themselves, to their others, and their others being, you know, in the broadest sense possible, right? Including everything, uh, you know, what is typically these days referred to as other than human entities. Um, and this is also a speculative lecture, so there are a lot of new thoughts in here that will partly perhaps make it a bit disjointed, where I have thoughts bubbling up that are then slightly underdeveloped in the in the paper. But that's also for everyone, hopefully, to shoot some arrows at uh, afterwards. Okay. Uh, I will read this in order to stay on course. I'll try to be it as make it as harmonious, as engaging as I can. Um, uh, but if there are issues, of course, intermediate that rise, please do. I guess if that's allowed, young, looking at the coordinator, please raise your hand virtually, and then we can we can look into that specifically. Okay. All right. So um, archaeology today is. I think concerned quite uh, fundamentally with how people in the past formed worlds around themselves that made sense to the groups involved. 
And this will be a notion that I'll try to develop in this, in this lecture more broadly to unpacking what I mean when I say that. Uh, and I think also in light of earlier work in archaeology, that's a significant shift as a primary concern for our discipline, uh, because we have for a long time worked around the definition of ordering past societies along a more or less uh, linear and differentiated evolutionary framework of complexity. And certainly my conception from the archaeology of the Americas is one where such generalized modeling at the moment does little anymore to inform the archaeological record. And measurement of earlier societies along an axis of complexity uh, on many occasions, in my view, seems uh, quite unproductive. What can be clearly attested are different ways of organizing and conceptualizing life worlds through aesthetically complex forms of objects, some of which you see on the slide at the moment, as well as ways, very particular ones, of marking local landscapes across parts of Central America. So to discuss asymmetrical dependency in my area of focus also implies engaging with existing and past modeling that's centered on economic strategies uh, deployed based on ecological variables. Right? So this linking between economics and ecology is a very strong one in Americanist archaeology, as, as some of you might be acutely aware of. Such work tends to suggest that the management of resources combined with the mitigation of scarcity through controlled distribution networks was a central pathway into societal complexity and forms of socioeconomic dependency. As studies from, for example, US Southwest, but you could go all kinds of directions with this in terms of examples, have repeatedly argued, such developing dependency could, however, only be maintained across generations. So for the mid to longer term, when population stability in individual settlements and groups of settlements was assured, uh, as well as the use of resource optimizing facilities, such as, for example, the use of uh, the ability to store staple crops, uh, Professor Albert Hall recognized this for the Central Andean, or the effective use of irrigation systems. The reality was likely that population circulation in this case of the Southwest, for example, was quite significant, as some of these studies have argued uh, convincingly, I think, and may have followed environmental changes, including climate, fauna, vegetational, and that such mobility not infrequently also resulted in migratory movement of a significant scale. And the book by Schachner makes that point quite elegantly. In turn, then, destabilizing existing conditions of dependency quite radically again. Such dynamics in the intermediate scale of societies, which I think between parts of Central America and the Southwest US are quite comparable in that sense. They are both, I think, intermediate scale societies. Uh, that raises discussions on the nature of these local communities and the concept of community itself. And archaeologists have fundamentally questioned traditional understandings of settlements as communities. So in archaeology, we tend to regularly recognize the idea of a settlement, obviously, but what a community is, is, of course, still a different matter. And part of this work on this slide narrates that as well. That considers the social malleability and flux that de facto constitute human groups and their networks in the past. And this, again, is also something that is quite a pronounced feature of the archaeology of Central America that is really quite hard to get a grasp on what these communities look like, how they are spatially, not to mention temporally, bounded, and how we recognize this archaeologically. So that then, in turn, triggers new understandings of the stability of leadership structures in social groups, uh, social groups being linked in one way or another to the idea of community, foregrounding understandings of diversity and heterogeneity in communities and various uh, forms of flux and fluidity that will have co-determined community boundaries and its concomitant dynamics, social economic dependency. In recent history of archaeological thought, I think we can discern two principal avenues of exploring the dynamics of archaeological communities. The first one uh, drove a significant amount of research between the 1990s and the early 2000s and still, I think, with us today, revolving around the archaeological study of situated practices, combined with the causal importance of individual historical contexts of action. Part of this work resulted in productive considerations of the links between the level of hierarchical stability, including structures of dependency during periods of increased social interaction due to, for example, migration. A key insight here comes from archaeological work in the American bottom or, or the wider Southeast US, 
where evidence migratory movements into newly occupied landscapes resulted in a redefinition of lived traditions. In other words, the reconfiguration of societal forms and norms and allowing for sometimes really quite sweeping changes in societal organization. And what we have on the, on the slide, you'll recognize the case of Cahokia in the 10th century AD is probably the most, um, for lack of a better word, spectacular example of, of such a radical change in societal organization in a particular area. So to keep this in mind, these types of, this flux and flow of societal organization and how fickle perhaps these relations of dependency then become over time, we can see how that might work out for Central America. And we'll come back to that um, a little later on in the paper. So that is the first body of research. The second uh, is focused on the ontological recognition that humans see relationships between themselves and the entirety of the surrounding world. And that goes back to, the, to my opening statement. Uh, and that includes um, uh, fundamentally everything, plants, animals, rock materials, everything that is organic as well as inorganic. And it may also include larger landscape elements, uh, mountain ranges, rivers, seas, coastal areas, uh, including and not limited to climate phenomena, etc. And that this recognition at the local level needs to be central to the archaeological analysis. Now that is of course a, a significant challenge for archaeological work because many might ask, well, so how do we go about this? Right? Uh, that is uh, uh, indeed something that we need to work on and current work is, I think, at the, to the edge of archaeological theorizing is trying to come to terms with how we can think about ontology um, uh, specifically in that relationship, society and ecology, and how we can come to terms that operable research projects that focus on ontology in an ontological sense. It's also an approach that's centered around agency and power, but one that pivots away from human-human inequality towards human-non-human relationships of dependence. And that to me is quite interesting at the moment. And I'll try to steer the discussion on asymmetrical dependency today a little bit in that direction. Anthropological studies tell us that these latter types of engagements are quite varied and unpredictable, but most foreground a recognition of the impact that the world can have on society and the human responses that are formulated to manage, for lack of a better term, that type of dependency as they realize it. Those responses are then in part theoretically at least, recovered or recoverable archaeologically in the form of manipulated landscapes, intercommunity ties and material culture that perhaps formulates a certain form of aesthetics to express what you might call an awe and understanding of the surrounding world. From the vantage point of the archaeology of Southern Central America, which has a quite significant amount of that aesthetic material culture, part of which you see here on the slide today. This is a so-called flying panel metate from uh, northern Costa Rica, uh, which is a, a sort of a ceremonialized, derived, uh, evolved example of a, of a regular grinding stone. They're obviously clearly much more complex than that at this stage. From that vantage point of that regional archaeology, I view human dependency beyond the human human dynamic in this paper, to center more around the entanglement of human groups with that wider world. And world, again, here in the sense of how those groups would have conceptualized that. I purposely use the notion of world as I think it suitably describes the openness of human appreciation for what we have tended to call natural surroundings uh, in a lot of literature earlier than this. In part, modern thought has rendered such entanglement through either liberalist or, for example, Western Marxist thinking, summarizing environments as resources or commodities and connecting that to a causal relation to emergent and developed patterns of inequality and dependence, as I mentioned at the outset. Part of these influential bodies of thought are clearly suspicious, I think, of the specific workings of political authority in the past and instead mostly focus on class-based exploitation through production relations. We can think back, for example, to Morton Fried's discussion of social, social stratification as emerging from differential resource access. Um, and, and some of this, uh, some of this archaeological work still continues uh, today, going under the heading of political economy. And while, of course, that is not a recent body of thinking by any means, it still remains rather influential across uh, significant swaths of the archaeology of the Americas. And this is work by Ken Hurt 
specifically uh, the University of um, Pennsylvania State University, where he's worked on this idea of the relatedness between political maneuvering and authority uh, on the one hand and uh, economic processes on the other. And of course, this thinking about political authority and how specifically power evolves in the past is a problem for archaeology that goes back you know, well into the earlier parts of the 20th century. And we can even think about people like Gordon Child who tabled discussions on the need for an archaeological understanding of authority and power that goes beyond these rather singular descriptions of kingship and sacred rulership that used to sort of uh, dominate, I think, a lot of archaeological or antiquarian scholarship up until the turn of the 20th century. And that kind of work is there now significantly so, right? Here on this slide, for example, we have the work by Adam Smith, who's talked about this extensively for cases of, uh, of, of Central Asia, uh, and, and a specific place also for, of course, perhaps closer to home, uh, the workings um, in my, coming from Maya epigraphy for the Mesoamerican culture area. So this began a long time ago and it's currently a still ongoing debate uh, on what these political workings in society exactly are. From small scale itinerant expressions of leadership that sometimes go under the heading of heterarchy to indeed hereditary, hereditary sanctified forms of rulership and how such political agencies were linked to the management of economic surplus. Early American psychological views of culture change effectively posited this cultural adaptation as taking place in the context of a larger ecological system. That point has been rolled out across case studies of the Americas and beyond, uh, but part of it is also rooted, uh, interestingly, in Central America as well. Uh, the, the concept is linked, obviously, to the work of, of Julian Stewart, and, and perhaps before him, the work of Carl Sauer and cultural geography more broadly, uh, and it's led to a significant area-wide Syntheses, uh, such as the Handbook of South American uh, Indians, uh, well known to you all, I'm sure, uh, which includes slightly less cited, probably volume four, on the Sarah, certain Caribbean tribes, which is a particularly challenging, uh, shall we say, part of the Americas for, for Stuart and the people he worked with in this, in this volume. So the role of environmental variables in anthropological paradigms attained considerable significance uh, from the 1950s onwards. And this, I think, echoes broadly through archaeology as well into the 1970s. Uh, one could go as far as to say that nature, as it were, displaced a, a Bosian understanding of culture as a theoretical basis for archaeological work uh, in a move that saw really quite historical particularist views move in a much more functionalist orientation in American archaeology, right? And of course, the idea of processualism is part of that package as well. But all of this revolves around the understanding that we're trying to get at of how humans interact with and, and relate to, uh, to environments. And this was, of course, a very pluriform uh, movement and gradual, right? And I, I'm, I'm, I'm sketching it here in terribly cursory terms, you know, no, no point to, uh, sort of no room to argue this in more detail. Um, but the point is, is that archaeological views on cultural form and cultural change have a deep disciplinary history of viewing this in ecological potentialities, either as a restricting factor, and you can think, for example, about the idea of circumscription in that regard, or as a resource extraction context from which exchange and distribution patterns then emerge. And again, here, of course, again, in the central MD, and we have wonderful examples of such mechanisms. So the control over landscape resources gave rise to studies on dependency in anthropology. Uh, for example, the famous patron-client relationships discussed a long time ago by Marshall Salins. And today we might think of such work as a classic of economic anthropology, um, but I think it's fair to say that it still remains quite influential in North American anthropological archaeological debates on the emergence of inequality and dependence and the work of Ken Flannery and Joyce Marcus uh, this book on the right-hand side, uh, still quite recent, uh, sort of a magnum opus where they pitch their argument one more time in a broadly comparative, uh, quite broad, uh, archaeologically and ethnographically uh, embedded study. Uh, controversial nonetheless, I would say. So here we see surrounding worlds in past societies as a lens as seen through a lens of economic determinism and functionalism that leads to inequality and power structures and hierarchy. 
Uh, it's a view that doesn't waste a lot of time on assessments into patterns of these asymmetrical dependencies between humans and their life worlds. So the attention specifically to political dynamics really only reemerged in the 1980s when political interaction and structure of asymmetrical hierarchies retrieved some of its analytical autonomy and discussions were no longer reduced to viewing the surrounding world as an arena, as, as it were, of resource domination. Specifically for parts of Mesoamerican archaeology, scholarly interest in the establishing and maintaining of societal structures of dependency grew during the 1980s, in large part also due to the decipherment of the Maya script and the wave of historically specific insights into the political workings of really quite particular localized classic period Maya communities that it then ushered in. Um, and of course, here in Bonn, there has been a tremendous amount of work done on that particular um, uh, study of the contextualized local political workings uh, of power, helped by these epigraphic data sets. And I think with the critical work of post-structuralists like Foucault echoing through the social sciences in this period as well, interest in authority and the location and legitimacy of power into a more balanced combined view of our economics was steering that slightly away to that one-on-one -on -one co uh, causal relationship between power and economics as well as social and cosmological practices to some extent was bundled uh, in, in a vast amount of studies, I think in the 1980s and 90s, and much of which under the heading one way or another of the concept of ideology. So the transition that we see here is that there is quite a, a fundamental undoing, I think ongoing of previously dominant ideas of social evolutionism in favor of more contextually and temporally specific understandings of authority and dependency. And that created a quite seismic shift in our political work across the Americas and elsewhere. It created a space to explore the workings of political bodies using ideas from the aforementioned practice theory uh, and amending it for archaeological methodologies, right? And the work of uh, what Tim Palpatine, who I just showed on the screen, uh, fits that agenda as well. So looking more closely at, at examples of such archaeological work, uh, we can see the adoption of, of Max Weber's views on authority in this, in this context, including an emphasis on voluntary compliance marked by situationally specific circumstances. And archaeologists, I think, if we try to understand why this gains some traction in archaeological work in that period, I think it's because they feel quite comfortable with Weber's views as they connect relatively well with agency thinking that at the time was also beginning to have more and more of an impact in the discipline in the Americas, sure. Theoretical thinking, which is of course grounded in the anthropological work of Pierre Bourdieu and the structuration sociology of Anthony Giddens. Um, and as a recent example of this, because it's still with us, Koenig and Barron usefully set out both the archaeological attraction of the Weberian emphasis on authority, detailing how communities are seemingly kept intact through a range of either coercive, ideological, negotiated, or voluntary strategies and stances. And such a range is effectively marked by a tripartite of dynamics defined by push, pull, as well as learned mechanisms. And the studies, uh, the ones I've looked at, really sort of run the gamut in terms of what, what variable um, is dominant in each particular case. And the work on Teotihuacan, which of course, in terms of leadership structures, is a particularly enigmatic case, uh, has also seen some work in this, and the work by Anna Beth Hedrick is, is interesting in that regard. So if we focus in on Mesoamerica, and specifically the classic Maya, uh, we see a vast number of archaeological interpretations into the workings of authority and the continued existence of relations of dependency as residing in sacred rulership. While there is disagreement on the level of conscious self-reflection by Maya rulers on their divinely ordained authority, various studies have focused on the political capital achieved through so-called esoteric knowledge systems. And those are still quite effective and durable in the, in the scholarly literature, is my understanding. Uh, these are, this is work that goes back, of course, to the, to the uh, seminal work by Mary Helms. It's quite close to the ideological views on political leadership that functionalism professed between the 50s and 70s, and predictably perhaps also the exact workings of esoterically motivated rulership is sometimes questioned through studies that are informed by practice field. I think again of Palkatan and others, and they would ask questions such as, 
okay, but so how does this actually play out? How is esoteric knowledge actually used as a binding mechanism to instill and invest rulership? Mm -hmm. Do we have archaeological indicators that Mesoamerican rulers in fact operated through particular esoterically charged objects associated to this idea? And the archaeology is often quite difficult to find in that regard. So while there is much to gauge from some of these more socially complex societies, and this is always the balance that a Central Americanist uh, has to come up with when he discusses his own region vis-a-vis uh, -vis these uh, rather more impressive areas uh, in other parts of the Americas, the vast majority of past societies would be my contention did not produce such archeologically iconic political landscapes like we discussed them habitually for the Central Andean or equally for parts of Mesoamerica. Instead, as I think my when working in Central America tends to understand, the evidence for political authority and the ensuing asymmetrical dependencies related to them is really quite scarce. Now here we have an overview, uh, rough cut, let's say, of the, um, uh, of the temporal uh, overview of, of human presence in this uh, Isthmian part of the Americas. Um, quite fragmentary still, uh, small groups of scholarship working in this part of what, the hemisphere. Uh, so everybody who feels that this is a call uh, to work, it is, right? So please contribute. Uh, at least what we can see, and there's the references and the materials I'll be showing you, uh, mostly, if not exclusively, relate to this, in the latest period of roughly the third century AD, right up until the Spanish colonization uh, in the early part of the 16th century, uh, where we have a range of, of societal forms emerging, and the aesthetics that I'll be showing you also sort of date to that period. Now, what there is in this part of the world, in terms of inequality, society hierarchy, or at least might be considered as proxies thereof, is often highlighted by a small number of very rich individual mortuary contexts, right? And the one that uh, stands out, I think, uh, amongst all of them is Sitio Conte in the central region of, uh, uh, of, of Panama, uh, a site that was uh, encountered and excavated in the first half of the 20th century uh, in part by Samuel Lothrop um, and resulted in a an avalanche of prestige objects, right? you know, from, from polychromous uh, ceramics, uh, and certainly prominently also in a lot of uh, hammered gold objects, some of which I'll, I might show you uh, now. Here's the excavation, just to dig into Lothrop's uh, uh, monographs on this and show you uh, the complexity of, um, so this is in a, uh, in a river basin, and you can see the, uh, the, the context is quite deeply interred, uh, and the materials that come out are, I think that as, a, as the saying goes, an embarrassment of riches, uh, a nightmare stratigraphically as it were, uh, but also equally in terms of, let's say, in terms of conspicuous consumption and, and uh, lavish funerary customs, a quite remarkable and outstanding example of something particular in terms of this individual or the individuals that were interned here. And indeed it are multiple individuals primary individuals accompanied by others as well. Uh, and you can see the detail here. Uh, so these are scenes that we would normally perhaps expect from places like Teotihuacan, right? And these are some of the, from the context, not too dissimilar, these multitude of individuals um, synchronically interred at any given one point. And this work was recently, in recent years, continued by a Spanish investigator, Julia Mayo, who you see on the right hand, bottom side, uh, excavating the neighboring location, uh, termed El Cano, uh, where similar amounts of material um, were also procured. So lavish, a, a small number of very lavish funerary contexts, uh, combined with arguments for the regional level verticality of authority as inferred from rank size distributions based on uh, the results of systematic service survey. Um, the latter, in turn, I think rests in part again on the work of Bob Carnero, outlining a, a limited number of smaller settlements that are permanently controlled by what you might call a chiefly residence or a chiefly village or a paramount chief, who are building off of a lot of ethnographic data uh, from different parts of the world, prominently including Southeast Asia. Uh, so that is probably the second proxy that archaeologists have used to talk about uh, inequality 
uh, and, and economic dependencies across Central America. But my point is, again, the data on this is very small, right? The case studies that qualify for such materials as such categories, you can count them on one hand or less, basically. In both the archaeology and anthropology of this Isthmian area of the Americas, we do see then these notions of subjugation and competition and lavish consumption. And probably one of the most pronounced, most pronounced examples of this is in the iconography surrounding uh, what is referred to as trophy heads that is mostly sourced back to parts of contemporary Costa Rica and parts of Panama as well, uh, again, from the period of 300 AD onwards. Much of this is very difficult to date, obviously, because by far most of these objects um, are decontextualized and, and are in museum collections today, most of which in the US, but also quite dispersed around the world, quite frankly. Uh, but these, of course, do give an indication uh, to this idea of, of headhunting and trophy head uh, practices as they are documented ethnographically around the world in different, in different settings and contexts uh, seem to be quite prominent in the, uh, in the sculptural practices and the sculptural programs as we see them from parts of Panama and, and Costa Rica. More examples of this, uh, even more on, on sort of ceremonialized grinding stones where it's sort of uh, stylized uh, heads, sometimes zoomorphic as well, uh, are included. And this is quite a common theme to see in the, uh, in the iconography. Bound individuals as well, clearly in a, in a you know, state of being deceased, considering the, uh, the style elements of the eyes. Uh, we also see this in model ceramics, um, and even sometimes quite aesthetically pronounced examples of this as well. And again, here the work of John Hoops, my colleague John Hoops needs to be acknowledged, uh, who has provided you know, quite a stimulating argument to see this practice of the taking of trophy heads not necessarily as a sign of coercive uh, violence or acts driven on by the desire to expand territorial control and the subjugation of others, but rather as acts to restore balance or ward off malevolent influences, including the curing of illness due to immoral human behavior, for example. And this is partly based on ethnographic data coming from the region and also partly comparatively in terms of headhunting practices worldwide. And this work, if you're interested in this, it's work published in this, in this book by Richard Chacon and David Dye, which is a comparative study as well. And then of course we have Spanish colonial documents, right? And these are not particularly suitable to understand, I think, this particular practice, uh, as, as much of it is quite straightforwardly equated to warfare and um, seemingly rather illogical barbaric acts. Uh, although archaeologists interested in detecting indications of competition and leadership structures uh, have viewed these materials as, as, as evidence for inequality as well. And the work by Elsa Redmond, for example, uh, who's worked across France and Middle and South America, is an example of this uh, also. Um, yeah, and these documents, uh, they are not as uh, profuse and as ample as they are for Mesoamerica or the Central Andean. Uh, all the more hazardous, of course, their interpretation and their reliance on them. Uh, many of them are also chronicles. Um, so the generalization level is quite high. Uh, Gonzalez Oviedo is one of those individuals who is, is quite a high impact chronicle for various archaeologists working in Central America. Um, but well, I mean, I think there's a, there's a pinch of salt that might be applied to this. Traditionally, Work in, in Southern Central America has built around various arguments of what was perceived to be middle range of societal complexity, right? these intermediate scale societies as I've discussed them earlier. And this resulted in the recognition of chiefdom level societies across the area, uh, especially when combined with the early Spanish colonial references I just mentioned that frequently talk about señorios or the other one can indigenous terms of cacique and cacicascos. The chiefdom here is the usual suspect when discussing political landscapes, as it is for much of the world, uh, where otherwise you might have early states, in the case of later Mesoamerican cases or, or the Central Andean, for example, or a whole bunch of more or less egalitarian ragtag of various forms of bands of nomadic pastoralists or hunter-gatherers. And that determines how humans bind together social politically. Uh, it's a concept that has been enormously consequential for archaeological work in the second half of the 20th century, 
uh, like the wider reevaluation, however, of the correlations between political authority and economy, uh, and then on the administrative function of political authority, the chief in concept has, however, also seen quite significant changes in how it's mobilized in archaeological analyses. So I'm not going to engage again with the criticisms directed at this problematic classificatory nature of, of this notion, uh, even if I support the view that they're rather unhelpful. Um, I think those, you know, the, if they're interested reader, I would refer them to Tim Parkinson's again work on chiefdoms and other archaeological delusions. Uh, that is quite a uh, scathing and, and humorous, quite frankly, as well, study into this, this uh, mobilizing of this concept and the pigeonholing of archaeological data into the notion of chiefdom. going to advance this a little bit, otherwise we might want to wait. Um, okay, I'll check the illusion. This illusion, right? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay, so ending up on the current day, um, the archaeological agenda into inequality is distinctly comparative, once again, and once again, classificatory in nature. As regional data sets have grown over decades, the means are now emerging to systematically connect and compare these to look for cross societal trends at the global level. So this is an incredibly ambitious uh, project that is uh, being undertaken, uh, led by a, a range of scholars from around the world, um, uh, around the world, so between commas, I should say, a uh, lot of them in Europe and, and the United States, uh, led by Tim Kohler and Mike Smith, amongst others, and they are asking questions such as, you know, how does inequality and dependency originate? How does it persist over time? And how can we understand the variability of a space and time uh, of such inequality? So in principle, that is a really interesting uh, avenue to explore, but the level of generalization that is needed because of this global comparative ambition opens it up to a lot of criticism as well. So to come to my main point, if you'll allow me, I strongly suspect that communities, and I understand those as groups of people who historically recognize and curate a range of social ties, were in most cases brought and kept together by the shared recognition of the importance to improve the odds of receiving help when asked. And that sounds a bit like a deviation from what we've been talking about, and that is intentional in itself. I think gift exchange theories clearly resonate with this, illustrating many occasions of feasting, diplomatic visiting, kinship exchange structures, object circulation, and coping with the challenges that the external world presented to communities of various scales was I think likely a source of creative solution finding to mitigate the risk of deprivation, as well as ensuring safety. The organizing off and reliance on cooperative or collaborative communal labor was a central part of those integrated forces, as well as how relationships to neighboring communities were regulated. These are two integrated dynamics that the archaeology of Southern Central America does provide case material for, and amply so, I think. Processes of maintaining relations seem to have been of paramount importance in the area, leading to what my scholar, uh, friend, colleague, uh, Rosemary Joyce calls a chain of societies connected through intentional human actions leading to travel, exchange, and participation by visitors in social events. And this is really, I think, where the strength of, of Central America comes out. The universally observed need to work together to ensure survival can be understood as a form of acknowledgement of the surrounding world and the latter's ability to affect humans beyond their direct control. This connects with anthropological considerations of the humanizing of the world and most collaboration in societies answers to transactional forms of navigating the overarching ability of the surrounding world to unavoidably influence people's daily lives. Again, I would like to point across the table the central Andean where we have, of course, vastly impressive evidence to that effect. If we look at the archaeological record of the Americas, the only presence of such transactional practices between humans and their surrounding world needs attention in discussions of asymmetrical dependency. This is even more pressing when considering the earlier mentioned lack 
of an abundance of unequivocal signals of political authority, at least in my part of the Americas, and the asymmetrical dependencies that might emerge from them. The wider context of, of Middle and South America offers inspiration as to how communities, human communities, tended to conceptualize their relations to what in Western ontological terms is traditionally referred to as nature. The extensive discussions on perspectivism are not far behind here, well publicized by now, rooted in Amazonia as a case study background, as well as the philosophically and anthropologically central question on the relationship between culture and nature more generally. Uh, and I think this is a fruitful body of work to consider for archaeological case studies. Indeed, ethnological studies find resonance in recent theorizing on the link between landscapes and humans in the past. Specifically, work by Tim Ingold has had considerable impact on what would later and currently be referred to as relational archaeology, arguing for the intentionality of, for example, animals and rocks in forging dependency relationships with humans. Beyond human agency, work by Ingold and others has argued for the agency of non-human entities, in other words, to argue that the world acts back onto people. Societies were and are prone to come to an understanding of how the world is to be engaged with that revolves around charting the possibilities and limitations for particular forms of human action. It will outline what aspects are beyond human control and those that might be possible to influence, for example, through ritual practice. In such considerations that are mostly, I think, based on learning and experience, readings, quote unquote, of the world can be achieved and elements of respect and dependence will be readily acknowledged. Such readings may in certain cases be a remit of a certain ritual specialist, but in principle, to some degree anyway, every member of a community or society would hold that agency. Understandings of the world in a particular way then also frame what might be asked of surroundings and the extent to which a society considers a specific engagement with surroundings to be permissible or even possible through socially accepted models of causality. This dynamic between the recognized agency of the surrounding world and the ability to interpret and mitigate such agency in turn frames human aspirations and ultimately enables power structures to develop as well. As Chris Gorsden has recently argued, power arises from controlling the world and the human productive action that shapes the world. This resonates with, but is quite different from the ecological functionalism that I talked about earlier. And it also connects to the notion of mutuality of being as recently proposed by Salins, working on the idea that people and the land they live in and off are mutually constituted. So this is a radical mixing, let's say, of the notion of kinship and landscape that argues for a relationally charged form of ecology. Area-wide considerations of the indigenous past of the geographies between the Maya region and parts of present-day Colombia, the area I work in, have their origin in the work of the early mentioned uh, uh, Julian Stewart and go even further back in time. Even if this conceptualization included that entire literal of the Caribbean Sea in its description of the so-called tropical forest tribes uh, in this handbook aforementioned of South American Indians. And the discussions on this particular area have been far and wide and still ongoing today. And for the sake of brevity, I, I think I will skip a little bit of this. Uh, the gist of those regional or area-wide discussions and redefinitions has often revolved around an unease of not recognizing sufficient uniformity uh, or homogeneity culturally in this particular part of the Americas, uh, which has generated many of those debates. Uh, the, the voice of John Hoops, uh, my colleague from Kansas University, is, is quite loud in these types of discussions uh, in terms of looking at a distance at South and Central America and trying to see what unites it uh, in some sense. And his thesis is mostly reliant on, he doesn't use the word ontology or worldview very often, but he talks more frequently about things like diffuse unity through a sort of cosmological awareness. And things like this have, have dotted the landscape of publications on, on Central American archaeology, um, some of which uh, are useful, some of which less so, I think, uh, many of which, however, 
stress this point of stability over time. And this appears to be a factor, right? If we think back to what I just mentioned uh, about, about Mesoamerica, where the flux and flow of societies can be quite dramatic, that doesn't seem to be the case uh, in this part of the Americas. So the practices that we see coming from this part of the world uh, are, for example, by making stone sculptures, which is really quite ubiquitous on a relative scale, uh, hemispherically compared, let's say. Uh, some are easily uh, portable, small scale uh, uh, sculptures, others weighing multiple tons. Uh, these might be carved or packed to show abstract ethnographies or, or some sort of anthropomorphic being, perhaps in a transformational state. Uh, and others are more comfortably interpreted as full figure individuals, and I showed a number of those already uh, in that section on, on headhunting. Uh, here we have another couple of examples. Uh, so in terms of subjugation, these are probably the, the closest uh, archaeological materials I can present to you, uh, literally bound individuals, uh, probably the result of raiding between communities uh, that were uh, that were produced as a, as a cause thereof. And this flying panel matata, again, as you see, or trophy heads are once again a feature of the iconography. Uh, it takes a bit of looking to detect it, perhaps, uh, with these, these long beak birds uh, pecking away at these, at these human heads that are on the, uh, on the legs of the, of the panel matata. Such works of stone are further combined with extensive programs of creating and maintaining mounded landscapes. And here we see part of the results of the work of Dita, uh, showing an investment of energy and labor to produce stone and soil and build these uh, mounded structures, at times perhaps as residential platforms, but on other occasions also as a manifestation of com commitments to the wider world, expressed through communal collaborative work. There is a good deal of variability in these expressions, and it's easy to say that we're dealing with mounted landscapes, but that is, includes a lot of variability. Um, and I think that most likely attests to the liberty of experimenting within the boundaries of what the world required and allowed for. And the case of Aguas Buenas, uh, like you saw here on the slide, is exemplary in that regard, being both a highly specific circular configuration that is also quite sizable in, in uh, footprint as well as number of structures, but equally, for now, also a one-of-a-kind archaeological site. We simply do not have any comparative material that, that connects well with that site. If we compare that to the orthodoxy that we see in other parts of the Americas, for example, parts of Mesoamerica, with highly codified uh, architectural programs, then there is quite a stark difference that we see in the pre-colonial indigenous societies that lived across the, the volcanic landscapes of Central America. Much more liberty to experiment. An additional difference as well is the lack of explosive growth at single local, uh, single localities across the Eastern area, as I mentioned earlier. And this is a phenomenon, this idea of explosive growth, uh, comparable to the idea of Cahokia, as mentioned earlier, uh, is quite common as well in Mesoamerica. With, with what you might call mega sites developing a relatively fast pace, growing exponentially in scale and an estimated number of inhabitants. Uh, and, and we see the usual suspects, of course, well publicized in their older iconicity on the screen uh, here. Some of these appear to also have been marked by colonial tendencies, territorial expansionism for one but mostly around economic motifs rather than cosmological rituals, for example. Clearly then, I think the connecting with fundamental features of the surrounding world, once established through these urban sites, was an attractive means to bring people together, but equally such rituals might either be called for on a temporary basis, losing their significance after a time, or simply exhaust their attractive capacity after certain periods leading to the inevitable abandonment and, and decay of these sites. By contrast, settlements across, again, Southern Central America did not exhibit such forms of apparently more, you might call prophetic belief systems. If we refer to anthropological studies in the area, particular insights can be found that address human, non-human dependencies. And this is my last point before I come to the conclusion. And the matter of asymmetry. In contrast to the much more widely referenced data from Amazonia and Mesoamerica, 
where anemic and analogical ontologies are widely documented to invoke the vocabulary that was recently proposed by Philippe Descolin, among the indigenous language groups of southern Central American parts of Colombia, there appears to be important distinctions to such ways of structuring conceptions of and practices in the surrounding uh, reality. And I would draw attention to the recently published work of, of Colombian investigator Juan Camilo Nino Vargas, uh, who recently referred to such schema as, quote, fields of possibility for thought and actions that determine the identities of beings and objects govern relations between humans and non-humans and organize the experience of space and time. And you see him here on the, on the right-hand side of the bottom. For the exploration of asymmetri asymmetrical human-non-human dependencies, I think it's worthwhile to explore this just a little bit further, illustrate an example uh, from ethnographic sources from Central America, which are exceedingly rare to find. So his work is really quite valuable in that sense. Temporal definition among the indigenous societies of Southern Central America is centered around sequential understandings of past, present, and future, in which the present is considered, uh, for lack of a better term, quite enjoyable, and the future is often a bleak prospect. Central to these delicate views on the progress of time is the transformation of humans into animals and other things. And this category, this is, this is a coherent category, right? So plants are a set epistemically on one end, and animals and every uh, inorganic material is set in another category. Um, and those transformations that would occur from humans into animals, or for example, rock materials or stones, and equally the irreversibility of such transformations. And these events are understood to take place when cataclysmic occurrences befall the communities and accordingly significant ritual practices are tested to form part of annually anchored calendars among various of the ethno-linguistic societies across specifically Costa Rica, Panama, and Northwestern Colombia. So predictably then also, animals that are observed in the present day are viewed as the remnants of past human societies that stumbled, tumbled into a form of subhumanity to use the, the vocabulary of Nino Vargas. And this is quite distinct from perspectivism for example. These catastrophic potentialities are premeditated by, again, immoral human behavior, for example, or various forms of ab abuse of landscapes. And given the irreversibility of these human to non-human transformations, as you see here on the, on the graph, and their negative net result, the dependency on the world to maintain balance is abundantly attested to this ethnographic data and studies of ritual texts, as well as poetry uh, in the contemporary. So what we can observe here are not merely cosmovisions, they are governing principles that provide order and instill dependence onto the humans that live according to such views. Humanity is, and again, this is a difference to uh, Amazonian ethnographies in many ways, humanity is at the center of such a conceptualization, but it also entirely depends on it. It is an asymmetrical dependency in the sense of humans being the only ones capable of delaying the potentially devastating and irrevocable changes from human to animal or mineral. And to prevent such scenarios, regimes of care are present among many of the agricultural practices of the various contemporary indigenous communities today to ensure a mechanism of reciprocity, to establish a two-way cycle of nourishment, and to protect both community and the cultivated land from harm. As the um, anthropologist Ernst Haltmeier refers to it also in this book, to this pattern as a hierarchical relation of mutual dependence, a hierarchical mutualism. And this clearly echoes uh, Salinger again, as I mentioned. Uh, just some final thoughts, perhaps to stir the discussion as well. And summarizing what I said, the idea of human dependence presupposes an alternative situation where there is complete independence. And the indigenous past of Central America does not really seem to offer such potential scenarios. Rather, archaeological and now increasingly anthropological sources are telling us that human life, from the earliest traces of engagement with landscapes, 6, 7,000 BC, seems to have hinged on dependency and a durable ontological view that this was an inescapable way in which the world worked. As I've tried to argue, the level of inequality within societies was less pronounced than through the balance between human life and the surrounding world. This then also puts forward 
I think, an alternative to earlier archaeological thought that deduced the relationship between environment and inequality as one where an increasing control over natural resources triggered evolutionary pathways to chiefly authority. Such a scheme, based on progress through a growing ability to shape and settle a natural environment, is a view onto the logical striving towards independence. And I would argue here that this need not have always been the case. And, and the materials from Central America offer avenues to push the alternative that notions such as worldview and ritual practice were in fact central drivers to human action and learning. The archaeology of Central America does not offer neatly defined area-wide analyses, and there are lots of problems, but there are overarching trends discernible in its pre-colonial history. One such trend is the level of stability, as I've mentioned already. And on the other hand, examples of highly skilled craft production that emerged quickly compared to surrounding cultural areas, but equally, cities never are never created. There is no urbanism in this part of the world, and the differentiation of social relations over time remains, let's say, at best, rather subtle. A human world dependency is one that is driven on by human reflection on what you might call the wonders and magical properties of the world in which we live. It is not one marked by finding solutions or manipulation, but by transactions to preserve and restore balance with the knowledge that society itself depended on that, what you might call divine and powerful world, and not the other way around. In that sense, I think there is asymmetrical dependency all across the pre-colonial history of Central America. 